today. This is Dr. Bill Fisher. I'm uh, coordinating the uh, School of Library and Information Science Colloquium program uh, this year, and this is our second uh, program for the fall term, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, John Dove, uh, who is with us today. John's a senior publisher with Credo Reference, and he'll be telling us a little bit about uh, what Credo is and, and what they do. Uh, John has an extensive background in electronic publishing and online education. Uh, and was, uh, has been doing this for a number of years. He was a part of a startup um, in 1968 uh, that uh, made accessible one of the first online databases. Uh, in this particular instance, it was stock market information. And he has uh, been in the um, sort of online uh, educational business ever since. He's been with Credo for about 10 years now. And um, we're going to hear John uh, give us some information about what uh, search engine designers could learn from the reference interview. So John, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Bill. And I'm glad to be back speaking at San Jose State. The last time I was there was maybe five or six years ago, and it was I uh, left Boston. And by the time I got to San Jose, there was a huge snowstorm in Boston. So I was so happy to be in San Jose. But um, now this is a, a beautiful fall day here. So uh, let me just say that, you know, in some ways, I was destined to be in this business. Um, my mother was a library. In some ways, I was destined to be a great researcher for Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, so clearly, online encyclopedias was something that I was destined to be in. It's too bad she didn't get to see that day. Because when I joined that, Wall Street, that startup on Wall Street in 68, her reaction was, oh, John, what are we going to tell the family? I thought you'd do something useful with your mind. <laughs> so I think she'd feel that I had um, come around but now that I've devoted my professional life to online encyclopedias and the support of libraries. This talk that we're giving uh, is, a, is part of an ongoing inquiry that we as Credo run as part of our understanding the market. And let me just say a few words about Credo as a company. The words I'm going to describe are perhaps not entirely unique in terms of business, but they are unusual. Our, our lead investor, and he was also the founder of Silver Platter, where I worked a number of years ago, talks about building a company that is in ecology. And like any good ecology, it's vibrant and growing if all the constituent parts of that ecology are experience themselves as well served by participating in that particular life. And so the role of management in such a company is not just to sort of decide what people should do and tell them to do it. It's much more to engage in an ongoing inquiry with employees about what it's like to work at the company with customers, in our case librarians, and their users in terms of what would really delight the users and really serve the needs of libraries, and with publishers who are a very important part of contributing the capabilities that we bring to the table. And so this inquiry that uh, we're going through today is part of understanding how do users find the world that they face today. And I was very glad to be able to get some of your input in terms of the survey that we did. And I encourage those of you who are watching this later to indeed go to those survey, that survey monkey and continue to put in information. It's very useful to us. So we're going to take a look at Google's vision for what users need and compare that with uh, you know, libraries and library systems and then also look at how Credo approaches the same thing. And this is an inquiry, as I said, that we've been going over the last a uh, number of years, and it's obviously a number of moving targets, moving targets in terms of what users need and moving targets in terms of what Google provides, as well as what Credo and other um, providers of library systems do. So I've added in a couple of things at the end of this presentation, which I may we may not have time to go over in detail, but I'm leaving in the presentation for those of you who see this, uh, uh, you know, see this offline. And one is an op-ed piece that I just recently wrote in Against the Grain about filters. And secondly, I know that a number of you may be interested in Credo's internship program. San Jose State is one of the main providers for us of, of internships, and 
we work with Sandy Hirsch, your, your dean, and others to come up with really good projects that are meaningful to us and our business as well as meaningful experience for you. So uh, there's a number of slides at the end that we'll go over if we have time, but I'm leaving in the presentation just in case. So let's start off by contrast, comparing and contrasting the world of Google and the world of, of librarianship. The man on your left is Terry Winograd. And by full disclosure, I need to mention to you the fact that Terry is, serves and has for a number of years served on Credo's corporate advisory board. He's been very, he's very well known in terms of user-centered design at Stanford. Uh, Terry was interviewed by National Public Radio and basically asked, uh, so what, what does Google really want to be able to do? And what Terry said was, what you really want is the mind reading machine. And a mind reading machine will know what you want. It will know what things you've searched for recently. So if you've searched for, you're searching for China, but just a few minutes ago you were searching for Japan, then it probably means you're interested in China as a country. But if your previous search was for dinnerware, then it's probably that you're, you know, knives and forks, then you're probably searching for, for China for dinnerware. So if you take into account your search history, then the search algorithms can do much better at predicting what it is that you're really interested in doing. So he described this mind reading machine and uh, that was, uh, and he, he indicated that he's a consultant who works with Google. In fact, his two students, uh, Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page, um, and he left his, his PhD program to go start Google. So then um, I'm not think we're gonna get the second audio either. The second audio was a response that came in from a listener. And the listener said, well, it's interesting to me to hear that your scientists are trying to figure out how they could build the equivalent of some big electronic brain that would somehow know what it is that you want and can answer all, all searching questions. So I, I hope you're sitting down because I actually can solve that problem. The series on search engines brought a suggestion from Amy Hartman of Toledo, Ohio. She writes, I was struck by frustrated scientists and business people saying that if they could just develop the equivalent of an electronic brain which could interact with people to help them find what they really want, that would solve all searching problems. Well, I hope you're sitting down because I can solve that problem. I am a public librarian. I do not require you to look at advertising. I'll keep asking you clarifying questions until I feel I have a complete understanding of what you're looking for. Why not give us a try? So indeed, this contrasts exactly the situation between what could be done by a, a Google or a Credo or anybody else who is a, a computer system and what can be done by the human interaction that in the reference world is known as the reference interview. If some of you may not have studied yet the reference interview, but you will if you're in a, in a library program. And actually really important is that there's a, the, the seminal article in, in the reference interview literature is one from Samuel Green, who was a public librarian at the, universe, at the Free Public Library in Worcester, Massachusetts. And he wrote in the first, uh, first year of American Library Journal back in 1876, an article about you should pay attention to users when they, readers when they come into your library. And it's a fabulous article, I highly recommend it. And he basically ends up describing 20 different people walking into the library. And for some, he takes them right to the resource they want. For others, he recognizes that this is a teaching moment, that this is an actual opportunity to give them some literacy about the use of the library itself so rather than answering their direct questions, he leads them to the catalog and shows them how they can answer their questions for themselves. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful article. But indeed, I think the, the key question is, you know, why is it that, uh, uh, you know, how would you compare what, what, what computers can do and what humans can do? But by the way, if any of you are looking for a mind reading machine, there was one on sale from eBay uh, several years ago, it was it was produced in 2265 and teleported to the com to uh, this common era time, and so there may be another one being produced later, and uh, I'm sure you'll snatch it up, and then the, then you'll have your own reading machine. So, uh, rather than thinking that Terry's comments that I paraphrased are just Terry's, here is a statement from Peter Norvig, who's Google's uh, CTO, director of research. 
And he basically says, gee, you know, many years from now, you'll just, you'll you know, interact with a digital intermediary, offer a few suggestions, and lo and behold, it'll come back an entire report just the way you wanted it, with exactly the level of detail you wanted. Now, you'll notice that there's very little in his description that involves a librarian. And that's one of the key differences that we find between uh, Google's vision and Credo's vision is that not that we want to replace a librarian, but we believe that actually the librarian brings to the table a significant understanding that is, that is left out with uh, just what the information is that Google has. So if we look at that, actually there's a lot of research that was done trying to compare query systems with reference librarians. I, I, you know, you can look at this literature a lot of it is definitely apples and oranges. It's, they, they did things like watch people coming back from a reference interview, and if they were smiling, then it was considered a positive result. If they resubmitted their query to a query system, that was considered to be a negative result. So uh, I don't think you can really put these numbers on this. I think this, this is a bit of a fool's errand to go after understanding the difference between the human interaction with a computer and human with a human. But I think we can definitely say that, that librarians are better at this. There is certainly the key question of why users underspecify their queries. It's uh, fairly famous in the literature around the reference interview that someone will come up to the reference desk and say, um, what do you have about fish? And the librarian is stuck with, his, oh, what, what does he mean, fish? Does he mean fish that swim in the ocean? Does he mean actually he's mistaken and actually he thinks that Moby Dick was a fish just as uh, Melville did? Or maybe he's talking about Joe Fish who's running for Congress in the local election. So a lot of, um, you know, frust even frustration is characterized in terms of how some people are so inarticulate at bringing out their, their question that they, they won't put what they even know on the table. And there's a lot of reasons why they might not. They may just, they may just want to see how much the information there is. So they don't want to over-specify the request because they want to have a full choice of what they want to see so that they can direct the drill down. They may not have the effective vocabulary, really. And we're later going to see an example of, of, um, uh, from Credo of, of drilling down into some information where clearly the inquirer may not have known the vocabulary, but learns the vocabulary in the pursuit of the, their inquiry. So, also, it's sometimes it's an emotional thing. When the person is asking a, a question to a librarian, there's very often a power relationship. You know, they've come up these granite stairs to go into this library, and maybe they're, maybe they're 10 years old, and, and, and so it's an age difference. And so a lot of what's done in training on the reference interview is to make sure that the librarian gives back this sense of confidence to the inquirer. You've come to exactly the right place. You've asked a really good question. Now let me just clarify a little bit of what you really mean. So this emotional aspect of making sure that the patron or the user, the student feels empowered by the relationship. So uh, it's not clear how query systems can do this, but it's uh, clear that that is part of the, the, uh, the experience of the, the, in the reference interview. So a key question in this is, gee, how well would a well-designed online reference service take some of these questions into account? It's, it's also fair to say that an important development within uh, Google has been that the autofill feature. And the autofill feature has done a lot in the area of some general Google searches to help with this problem of underspecification because suddenly you're given a set of choices. And how those choices are drawn upon is related to how much Google knows about the population of users and their questions. I'm curious, and if you want to enter in something into the chat about how well you think autofill works. And is there a distinction between how well it works in everyday world searching and academic searching? So I believe all of you can see the chats that are presented. So uh, I'll encourage you to enter that information now as to how you found autofill in Google and whether that, in fact, has, um, has answered a lot of this question of underspecifying queries. And does it work equally well in general searches as it does in 
academic kinds of searches. So, so now I want to back up while you're filling in some of those uh, answers. I'm going to uh, back up and says, look at this question about, first of all, I'm going to say just categorically, reference librarians are better at this than computers and, and always will be, at least in my lifetime and your lifetime. So, um, and, and one of the reasons is that there's so much context that the librarian knows that um, even before the questioner has opened their mouth. So first of all, this, this reference interview or, or an inquiry on a computer system is, is a nexus between two unknowns. The inquirer has a general idea of what they want to know, but they don't really know what there is to know. And the person or system or whatever else that's answering them knows a lot about what it has to know, but doesn't really know what the user is interested in. So there's this nexus between these two unknowns. And in the 60s, Robert Taylor, who's done a lot of work around the reference interview, came up with five elements of context that the reference librarian is going to know, even many of these, even before a student has opened their mouth or the patron has opened their mouth. So I'm just going to show you a little thought experiment that makes it really clear about how this works because uh, I'm going to show you a reference desk and picture in your mind, I'm going to talk about two examples, the Parsons School of Design. It's a, probably one of the elite design schools in the country in New York, it's in Manhattan. And students coming to that reference desk at the Parsons School of Design have, you know, if it's the beginning of the semester, they've got 14 months to finish an MFA at the top design school in the country. On the other hand, at the West Virginia Northern Community College, that serves a lot of people in that area with, and indeed a lot of them are, are getting allied health kinds of certifications and uh, taking a, a lot of things that's very practical for them to actually get jobs. So I don't think anyone could miss which reference desk this is. So even though this a student coming up, you, clearly it's, uh, th this, this reference library already knows a whole lot of things. This is not the Parsons School of Design. So uh, it's, uh, and, it, and already she knows things about the likely subjects, the likely characteristics of what a good answer will be for that uh, student, and uh, m many elements of that aspect of context. And if this were the Parsons School of Design, and it would look different, you can imagine how lucky that student is, that they are now talking to somebody who has helped several generations, not generation, but several years, decades perhaps, of students get their MFA in 14 months. So she's going to, or he is going to know a whole lot of things to suggest to that student that uh, it, the student wouldn't have asked, it, let's say the student only asks a few questions and doesn't even ask about things that the reference librarian will know, by the way, you know, it's, it's, you, you're really going to want to know about this particular database because I know your first course is going to be in this particular aspect of design and, and uh, you'll be doing really well if I show you these things. It'll all be mirroring many of the things I mentioned about what Samuel uh, 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 Green talks about in his article, but now applied to the Parsons School of Design. So I'm now going to describe to you um, a framework that we've developed at Credo that allowed us to sort of really define sort of how we wanted Credo to interact with people. And it doesn't mimic the reference interview. It, it's, a, it's really a matter of thinking of a query system. And it, it relates to, it, we call it the user modes of reference. And each of these modes are define a certain psychological state that a user might be in. Now, this is a, it's not uncommon for, for system designers to have models of users. They tend to have models of users, which are, well, we've got one model as a, new, a, newbie, a newbie, and then we've got the expert, and we've got the teenager, and then we've got the lawyer. So this model is actually at a finer level of granularity. It basically says that the same person may actually have a different expectation state with regard to certain queries. And they may not actually even be self-aware of which state they're in. So you can imagine a, a doctor 
in the morning is prescribing a medication and uh, wants to know if there are any counterindications for that medication. And in the evening, early evening, he's finishing up a paper that he's going to present and he needs some citations for other references. And he has a little bit of time left over and he's told, been told about uh, a great site that has information. He's a ear, nose, throat doctor and he wants to know, gee, what are the 10 things that I ought to know about dermatology? And so now he's exploring this whole subject. That same doctor in those three settings has very different expectations in terms of what constitutes a good delivery of information. And most importantly, the issue of the difference between false negatives and false positives. Now, if any of you don't know what false negatives and false positives are, just put a question in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll cover that. False positives are very much things that are unexpected, serendipity. And, uh, you know, I still remember the first search that I made on, on what Credo used to be called Exerfer Plus. And even before I joined Exerfer 10 years ago, I got, I got on and tried a uh, concept map, which is one of our exploratory tools, and you'll see some versions of that later. My wife teaches English as a second language, and for many years she taught a group of refugees in a suburban high school in Boston who were foster children taken from uh, a refugee camp in Kenya. They were from the southern Sudan, and they were from a tribe called the Dinka. And for very obscure reasons, it turned out my father had done some research back in the 30s that where the Dinka as a tribe were an important element. So. I decided to do a concept map on Dinka. And up came a whole bunch of things about sub-Saharan agriculture, about Aboriginal metaphysics, about a whole lot of set of things that would obviously be related to a tribe from the Southern Sudan. And then along came, a, it was another node around Doris Day. <laughs> Doris Day, what, what could that possibly be about? And I thought, did she, did she, was, is she a foster parent of a Dinka child or something? And then I looked, drilled down into that particular cluster, and there was songs that Doris Day had done with Jimmy Durante, including the song Inca Dinka Do. So this is an example of a false positive. And if it's presented correctly to a user, that can be completely delightful. If it's presented in an area where you're studying the details of the Dinka tribe and suddenly Doris Day and Inca Dinka do come up, it's, it's an extreme annoyance. So the modes of reference was intended to be able to get at the differences between those two user experiences. And we came up with four major categories of modes. And this was useful for us because some of these are ones that we felt that we didn't right now have the full capability to deliver detailed bibliographic research projects, as you would normally do for the literature search of a PhD student, because they need to be able to have a very detailed, um, and, and also their tolerance for false positives, and, and particularly false negatives, is, 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 is uh, very, very low. So awareness. So this whole area of research support, it's something that we do a little bit of. It's not a natural thing for online reference, because by the time that something's in an encyclopedia, its uh, awareness is, is not going to be an issue. So uh, we now do have some awareness capabilities on some of our topic pages, but it hasn't been really central to us. But the first were the areas that actually extra for plus was excellent in, which is this uh, fact finding. It's sort of ready reference, a quick answer. You've come across a word in French while reading an English novel and you didn't study French in high school. And you, you just want to get an answer and get back to what you were doing. And a very large percentage of interactions on the computer and in the iPhone when you're driving with your, your buddies up to on a trip, you know, a lot of it will be, gee, well, who won the, the World Cup in 2010? Or, you know, these kinds of quick answers and you're quickly on your iPhone and you got an answer. You're not source sensitive if you're in quick answer mode. You are if you're in definitive answer. And definitive answer was now you suddenly need to be able to know that it comes from a source that you, that you can stand by. And sometimes that's advice from a librarian. Sometimes it's just, it's really in the sense of the user's need. So perhaps you have a bar bet with some buddies and, um, you know, you know they won't take anything from the Globe, so it has to be from the, from the, uh, the, the Herald. So 
we found that we had to do this well, but more important, the area that we really wanted to excel at is in this whole area of discovery. And you're going to see some examples of this. And indeed, the poll that I gave you was, you know, where do students get stuck and need help? And I'll go over some of the answers that we had from this. And unguided exploration is very much like surfing the web. You know, people who like reading encyclopedias, and um, my guess is about 15% of any audience I ask will say that, will admit to the fact that they like reading encyclopedias. But the ones who do, what they like about it is this randomness, this, uh, they don't know where they're going to end up. And it doesn't matter because they're on a journey they're enjoying. Guided exploration has much more of a purpose in mind. And diversion is indeed ways of making the whole thing fun. And one of the ways I found that that was important in reference is I wrote a piece for the opening of the ALA's Guide to Reference, and in doing so, went back and reviewed uh, the 1902 Guide to Reference. And they had a list of the 100 must-have titles. And when I went through that 100, there were four or five that I couldn't categorize as anything other than they were meant to make the whole library fun. And I think that any system needs to be able to do that. So we're not going to go over the details of the survey results, but I did want to be able to just share with you a couple of the things that came from uh, from those um, that, that stood out for me when I read the, the surveys. And some of these are new. Uh, they're, they're different over time over what I've seen over the last several years. So uh, a lot of them evaluating resources, uh, knowing where to go next. Uh, having a vocabulary with which to uh, in instruct their queries, uh, broadening and or deepening searches. And one that really stood out many times was that students get stuck when suddenly they're drawn, they have an entry and they go to it and it's a, it, it doesn't get to the full text. It turns out that it was a bibliographic uh, entry or there's a firewall, so they're just frustrated because they, you know, they're, they're teased. And I like to use this phrase, discovery without delivery is a disservice to users. Now, librarians may be able to make use of bibliographic materials because they know what they are, they know the value of them, and they know what circumstances they're to be used. But a student with a paper due tomorrow it doesn't do them any good to show them stuff that they could get by interlibrary loan if they spent three weeks to do it. So you really, you know, a system really needs to be able to figure out how to avoid that. And uh, Credo has always been about full text. Obviously, we point to other databases, so it's not always the case that we can control the whole experience. But um, so I now want to draw into uh, into a little bit of a discussion about what Credo does. What What's the secret sauce inside of Credo? What if, because one thing we do, sometimes people think we're an ebook vendor. And we actually, what we do with our content when we get it, we have a publishing system that tears apart what comes into us. And we look for content that is actually chunkable, that makes sense in small pieces. And subject encyclopedias are the bread and butter of Credo. And they're certainly match that requirement exactly. So I'm going to actually limit my discussion specifically to that content type. It's about 80% of our titles. And we strip them apart into their own individual entries, but we extract the human intelligence that's in those subject encyclopedias. And that human intelligence consists of both what keywords have been chosen to be about that subject. So if you have the encyclopedia of gun violence, you know, we have something like that from ABC Clio. And you know it's going to have a vocabulary of what's related to gun violence that has been chosen by a set of editors and say, these are the important terms that you need to know if you're going to really understand gun violence in the United States. So that's a human editing curation that's happened, and that we extract that knowledge to drive some of what we do in creating our concept map. And the other thing we have are the see alsos. And if you think about these see alsos, those aren't just comments about, uh, they're not just specific to a book. So if you have an encyclopedia strategy and you have an entry on strategy, let's say it's um, encyclopedia on general systems thinking. And so now there's a section on strategy and it says strategy C game theory. 
And in the game theory one, they didn't bother saying C strategy because they thought it was obvious. And being constrained to the limits on what's on a page and, and their entry, they, they were only allowed four C also's. And so they thought that we know that the relationship is symmetric. They said, well, C game theory. So it turns out that these relationships are both symmetric and transitive. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, please ask a question. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it during the Q&A. But by being both symmetric and transitive, it means that internally, inside of Credo, we can create those, re those other relationships. And we can create a relationship between game theory and prisoner's dilemma back, all the way back to strategy. Now, we don't take it to a complete closure, but uh, you, you can actually, what we do is a partial transitive closure of this network. And that's what drives a lot of what we see in Credo. So now I'm going to show you how that actually can work. So I don't know if you can see the specifics of this particular map, but it's uh, something that somebody was taking an introductory course in, uh, in evolutionary biology. And one of the things that I learned many years ago in a, in a setting in which we did a lot of work around accelerated learning is that people learn fastest what they almost know already. So if it turns out that I actually already knew what allopatric speciation was, so I sort of might know what sympatric speciation, but somebody just popping into this uh, speciation map might not know what those are, all are. But let's assume that they end up being intrigued by this, uh, this question of sympatric speciation. And they're researching this not, not to do a detailed research, but perhaps to review for a test or for ideation and deciding what paper they're going to write because they have to write a paper and they don't know what topic they're going to write about. So they hit on speciation and up came this concept map. Now we could do this live if we were live on Credo, but assume that they just now clicked on the sympatric speciation um, uh, node, and that will then be, it'll all reconfigure itself. It looks like a lava lamp when it does it. It's really neat. And uh, now sympatric speciation will be at the center. And now there's a whole map around symp sympatric speciation. And, you know, let's say the student noticed evolutionary distance, and that sounded like something they might want to learn more about. And they can do a mouse over, and you can see the mouse over popped up what evolutionary distance means. So now, if you think back to some of the needs of, of uh, you know, students being able to broaden the search or deepen a search, this is a really good example of how to be able to do that. So another example of how Credo has done things in terms of some of those elements of context is the literati topic pages. And I know this is really fine print, so it's going to be able to feasible for you to see. But when you get into, I'm leaving on the last page a trial ID that is good until the end of November. So you can get into Credo and see these topic pages. And the thing that's really fabulous about topic pages is it deals with the fact that if you're a student at San, San Jose State and I happen to be at NYU, you know, you have different databases than I do. NYU has 1,800 databases. The chances that an incoming freshman knows which databases are useful for DNA is, you know, is very, very small. In fact, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, interesting cases where people have talked about usability studies where a student was looking up, um, you know, some neuroscience, and they went to JSTOR. And when they were asked, well, it was a junior, and she was a good student. And they said, well, why did you go to JSTOR? And she said, well, my English professor last semester told me about JSTOR, and it was really, really useful. So this is the level of understanding that many, you know, even really good students have. And so the whole idea of literati is to be able to say, all right, if I'm looking at DNA, then the databases and further places for study that I'm going to find on this topic page will be things that the librarian at that institution says, these are the right places to go. So, you know, if you were at San Jose State and you looked up Ezra Pound, there's no sense in taking you to the Columbia Poetry Database. It's a great database, a great place to be if you wanted to study Ezra Pound. But San Jose State doesn't have the Poetry Database from Columbia, but NYU does. So if I'm at NYU, I get a different topic page than you do. Even though these topic pages live on the open web, when I click on mine, I get 
the NYU version, and when you click on yours, you get the San Jose State version. So we do a lot of stuff around IP authentication and IP recognition and cookie chasing and a whole lot of other things to give you the most, the, the best set of topics to go to based on input from your librarian if you would subscribe, if San Jose State were to subscribe to Credo. And I get ones that based on the, the input that the NYU librarians would have. So, so anyway, I'm not going to go over all the details of all of this, but um, basically this uh, sort of laid out, I've sort of laid out here sort of the three major steps in Credo's evolving vision. Uh, the first was that an entry in a subject encyclopedia is, a, is this little atomic, it's like a microcosm that has within it, if you extract the human intelligence that's in it, it is a launch pad into where you would want to go next. And we have been, XML, XML was first promulgated in 1998 standard, and Credo started in 1999. We have been thoroughly XML right from the beginning. And so we recognize certain entities of people, places, events, works, institutions. And if you take a particular entry and, and mark it up for those things, they then can become the, launch, the, the linchpins or launch pads to take you to where you, ought to, where you might want to find out more information. And this follows very much what a learner's pathway is going to be. Um, and it's not just inside the library. It's also even in resources outside the library. So the second part of our vision is this fact that we can put these topic pages on the open web and use them to entice students into libraries without even their knowledge. I mean, they'll notice it as it happens. But they're not going to have to decide, oh, I think I will go to my library's website and do this query. Our whole vision in this aspect is to have topic pages be very prevalent on the web, that people trip across them right when they happen to be curious about something, and, uh, and then they end up in their library. And the way that we're doing this, and it's, something, it's a work in process, is both through search engine optimization, but also through partnerships with other players. So, an example is EasyBib, where you know if you if you cited Wikipedia, it would pop up with a pop-up saying, you know, your your professor may not want you to cite Wikipedia. Would you like to see a Credo topic page that you can cite? So we're looking at more and more of those kinds of business opportunities that will allow to these things. So uh, my microphone says it's about to run out. So uh, hopefully it'll last a little bit longer. So if it suddenly we can't hear me, we're going to have to shift to my computer's uh, microphone. So the third level of this vision is that indeed we can provide a whole set of services built around the reference encyclopedias that focuses on information literacy. So, so anyway, that's the conclusion of my talk about comparing Google and Credo. I hope that it was useful. And it does now give us a few minutes where I can talk a little bit about against the grain, uh, this op-ed piece I did about filters. And then uh, I'll leave for you a description of our uh, internship program. This question about uh, filters, Clay Shirky, who's a famous media scientist at NYU, talked about how uh, he gave us a session about five years ago in which he talked about how when people talk about information overload, what they're really saying is that their filters are failing. And he gave the example of how when Gutenberg came out, it suddenly was able to produce more books than anyone could read in their lifetime. But it created this odd commonality where the person who's producing the publication has to also know about what's worth publishing. And the reason is because it's very expensive to put together this press and here's a very elaborate one from 1850s. So if they made, if they published the wrong things and it didn't sell, commercially it would be a big mistake. And so it, this, this publishing industry grew up with this combination of knowing how to run the press and knowing how to choose what's worth publishing. So what's happening today is because the publishing cost has gone to zero. Any one of you later this afternoon can post on a blog and it's available to the entire world and it wouldn't have cost you a dime. So his sense was basically, it's not information overload. We've always had information overload. What it is, it's filter failure. So I put this question on, on its head and said, all right, well, what's filter success? I don't have any answers to these questions, 
if you have any, if it spurs your mind, please email me. I'm at Dove, my last name, at credoreference.com. I'd love to keep in, you engaged in the inquiry. And um, who knows, filters, maybe people will be buying filters and not just books for their library. And then the question was, who produces these? And is there a seal of approval that says, all right, this is a well-established filter that it behaves in the proper way. It allows people to opt in and opt out. So uh, that's my filter spiel that was in the uh, uh, against the green this month. And finally, just a few slides about Credo's internship program. As I said, San Jose State's one of the one of the top schools in providing us interns. And if you have any friends who've had one of those internships, talk to them. I think that they they uh, the feedback that we get is that they really find that this has been very uh, special and different from other internships. And uh, they're all paid, and you'll you'll. You won't be paid as nearly what you're worth, I, I assure you, because you'll work hard, and but you'll learn a lot, and, and, and we do believe that they all should be paid something. And, and the way we're able to make them work virtually is through the now available technologies that 10 years ago when I started at, at uh, Credo, this, the, a lot of these things were not in place, and we could not have done this kind of virtual internships. But you will be working on real customer problems that we have and engage with those customers directly. You won't just be doing um, back office kind of uh, work. I mean, you will you will do some back office work because we all do, but you will really do uh, uh, a lot of meaningful stuff. So, and there's a little tip from our HR person on how to get hired because uh, so you can apply this anywhere you go. Um, uh, it's, it's it's valuable. So. And here is the website to check in terms of virtual internships and the the uh, the trial ID which I promised. So that brings us to uh, to 12:45, and I believe now we're available for this next 15 minutes. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, John, so much for your presentation. And um, while people are uh, thinking of. Uh, questions they may want to ask or putting something into the chat box you'd like uh, John to potentially uh, follow up about. Um, let me uh, go ahead and follow up on, on his last sort of theme of the um, internships that we've had now with Credo for a couple of years and um, this uh, to some extent came out of an interaction at a conference a couple of years ago uh, where our director, uh, Dr. Hirsch, uh, was. I was there and uh, I, I was the faculty supervisor for the first few. Uh, now um, these are all virtual internships. You, again, do not need to be in the Boston area to do one of those, so Dr. Uh, Franks supervises those, but um, if anybody's interested, you can uh, check out the um, URL that John, John has up there, and um, let me remind you that we uh, had an orientation for spring internships last Saturday. Uh, and that recording is available, and we have a second um, orientation session for internships tomorrow evening, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, so if you are interested in one of these. Uh, and what John didn't uh, say was that um, oh, two or three or four of the first interns over the first couple of semesters, in fact, got hired by Credo, uh, that that's how well the program uh, went and that's how much they enjoyed uh, working with our interns. So it did, in fact, lead very directly to some employment. And so now, um, if you're an intern with Credo, I think your your uh, internship supervisor at Credo is one of our former students, one of the people that have actually gone through uh, the process. So if somebody has a question, uh, you can either click on the mic or put something into the chat box and um, we'll uh, have John respond. We seem to have uh, at least one person typing, so we'll, we'll wait patiently. Well, now, now I don't see an indication of uh, anything. Um, Oh, there they are. There's some questions. 
So, uh, John, can you read the, uh, are you seeing those questions in the chat box and, and is your mic working and can you respond to uh, those? All right, I think I'm back on. So Bill, can you, Bill, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I think okay. we can hear you now. So if you so, can so here's read a question. those. Uh, here's a the, question. Right, in the, the questions are in the chat box. Yeah, so I see a question from Ray. It says, is, right. or, uh, does everyone able to read the question already or do I need to yes. repeat it? No, I don't think you need to read it. Everybody should be able to see the chat box. Yeah, so uh, this is a really good question because uh, uh, one of the things that's been really valuable to us is by having a, a really brilliant way of extracting the human intelligence of these different subject encyclopedias means that we do not need to have a controlled vocabulary or a uh, or human editors going through and deciding these relationships. Now we certainly do from a quality perspective, sort of a search quality, we sometimes will uh, fiddle with what uh, comes out just because we think it might be misleading. But it's not a standard part of the process. The, the, the content speaks for itself. Now part of that is served by the fact that the reference experience is general. And so in a lot of those exploratory modes, so false positives are perfectly all right. When you're in the concept map and you're, as, as I was describing with Dinka, but you can describe it, you can see that it's a person who's sort of in that mode, they're, they're, in, a, they're in a situation where they're going to be, you know, comfortable with the fact that they're going to be presented with some things that aren't quite right. So that means it gives us significant latitude to be able to build at scale thousands of subject encyclopedias and still have a good user experience. So if you were building a difference reference system that was very specifically about, you know, a, a hospital setting, in which case the whole context of the reference was medical information, then you'd want to follow a controlled vocabulary around MeSH and make sure that things are you know, properly understood, that there's a synonym between heart attacks and myocardial infarction and everything else. But in a general reference sense, that's not been a need for us. Uh, I sometimes use the expression, we're superficial and proud of it. Because our purpose is to pass somebody to where they ought to go next and not try to answer everything that they need to know. So it's part of our empowerment of users is actually recognized that the role of reference is really to make the rest of the library come to life and not try to be the whole library itself. So we've avoided these uh, uh, overly rigorous, uh, you know, senses of either of a human process to, to edit all of these things or um, one that would go towards the controlled vocabulary kind of direction. Um, Lucy Carroll uh, comment. Um, Yeah, I think in, indeed a lot of ways the use of the concept map do, do kind of prejudge these kinds of questions. Exactly right. Um, right. Uh, that saw those two questions. Seems to be so, what uh, we have. Any other uh, questions or comments? Again, if you want to put something in the chat box or if you want to uh, grab the mic, uh, please do so. And. And I'm. I'm putting in my uh, email address so you can email me if there's something that, a question that occurs to you later or if you just uh, uh, want to add to the conversation. I'm glad to follow up with you. Great. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, looks like we may have another comment from Lucy. Uh, there's also the recording and we'll have, we'll also do a YouTube version of this and that um, will go out to everybody when that is done and John I'll get you the URL to the YouTube version uh, when that's prepared. So uh, Lucy does have a, a question. Great. Well thank you very everybody. Oh I'm sorry here's a question. Who puts together the topic pages? 
uh, there's actually uh, most topic pages are generated by a, uh, a algorithm that we use. We carefully watch over them to make sure that there's uh, not something really um, egregiously wrong. And there are some problem areas where you know if you look at Pluto, does it you know mean the planet or does it mean um, um, the Greek god or you know there's a lot of um, areas where there's a lot of homonyms and we try to sometimes disambiguate those. Uh, we have to do a fine tune, and, but um, there are some special topic pages which um, this is one of the things that we have. Um, uh, interns do. If we do a, if we have a literati assignment where we need to bring to life some of the things that are most important to a particular library because it fits with their strategic initiatives, and there are a handful of topic pages that would be really influential in that experience, then we will handcraft the topic pages uh, for those for those settings. So. And my my recollection is that some of the first interns, in fact, did that from some yes. requests you got from some uh, some of your academic uh, customers. So that was, and they found that to be uh, just a phenomenal experience. Exactly. But we have over ten thousand topic pages, and a lot of them. Uh, so m most of those are generated automatically. But there's, you know, but we really the literati product is really focused on the specific special information literacy needs of a particular institution. So um, we've got hundreds of those, but um, most of them are generated automatically. Great. Okay. Uh, again, thank you, John, for uh, being with us today. A wonderful presentation. Uh, thank everybody who was online with us. And our uh, next um, uh, colloquium session for the fall will be on uh, no Monday. It's going to be a Monday, November 25th. That's the Monday prior to um, Thanksgiving. And our speaker will be uh, Virginia Tucker, Dr. Virginia Tucker, who's also on our faculty, and she'll be talking about uh, expert searching and uh, some of the things she found out about what makes an expert searcher uh, with her recent doctoral research. So um, some of that information is uh, online on our website already, and we will get out announcements later in November prior to that particular session. So thank, thanks, everyone. Again and again, thank you, John, very much for your presentation. Thanks a lot, Bill. Bye.